We are going to get the morning session underway with an address from one of the greatest public servants of our day, Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma. But before we do, before we do, we'd like to add to the roster of distinguished public servants that we have had joining us at this policy orientation. I would like to introduce to you, for the invocation, Representative Stephanie Click. She represents House District 91, serving the cities of Halton City, Halton City, Richland Hills, North Richland Hills, Watauga, and a portion of Fort Worth. She's been the chairman of the Tarrant County Republican Party for six years. And during the 83rd legislative session, she was appointed to serve on the committees of human services, house elections, rules and resolutions, and also chair of the Tarrant County Telega delegation. Please join me in welcoming Representative Stephanie Click for our invocation. If you'll bow with me. Father, thank you for all those that are here today gathered to learn uh, and help advance the cause of liberty and conservatism. Uh, help us uh, join together and promote this cause. Uh, be with us today and as we travel uh, back and forth uh, to our homes, uh, in his holy name we pray. Before we begin, I would like to recognize the legislators who have joined us uh, today, and please hold your applause to the end. I believe in the room we have Senator Bob Hall, we have Representative Jason Isaac, Representative Stephanie Click, who so graciously gave the invocation, uh, Representative Matt Krause, Representative Rick Miller, Representative Paul Workman, Representative Dennis Paul, and Representative Bill Zedler. And is there any legislator present who I did not name? I will take that as a no. Please join me in giving a round of applause, thanking our legislators. <laughs> not, not just for attending, but also for the hard work that they do. They are truly individuals who live uh, Theodore Roosevelt's maxim of the man, or in some cases, the woman in the arena, and we are grateful uh, to them for it. In 1796, George Washington stunned the world, not by something that he did, but by something that he refrained from doing. He elected to not run for a third term as President of the United States, which, uh, in the words of Lin-Manuel's Miranda, King George III, I didn't know that was something someone could do. It was simply assumed that George Washington would continue in office uh, until he died. It was the expectation. And in fact, it was the expectation of democracy in general. And in Washington's farewell address, uh, it was in fact the first issue that he addressed, not the course of the new nation, but in fact why he was electing to return to Mount Vernon and cede the presidency to someone else. And he wrote, uh, in part, I am withdrawing the tender of service and am influenced by no diminution of zeal for your future interest and no deficiency of grateful respect for your past kindness, but am supported by a full conviction that this step, that is the choice not to run again, is compatible with both. Washington was telling Americans that the best thing he could do for them and their democracy was to refrain, to step down. And in fact, this was a spirit that animated the age of the American founders. Uh, it is commonly forgotten that the association of ex-army officers who served under George Washington called themselves the Society of the Cincinnati. Cincinnati being, of course, the plural of Cincinnatus, a legend that we have forgotten more or less in our day, but was in fact a famous Roman Republican military leader whose most famous act was not actually winning the war that he was called upon to win, though he did, but upon winning the war and holding within his grasp the full power of the Republic, elected to relinquish it and return to his farm to live out his days. This was the admirable model that the American founding held up. And in our age, in which we so frequently laud individuals for what they do and for the power that they acquire and how they yield it, we must not forget that a foundational act in our democracy, in our liberal republic, our classically liberal republic, is in fact the relinquishing of power. And we should extend equal, if not superior admiration, to those men and women who have the character and the moral fortitude to let it go once it is in their grasp. It is an exception rather than the rule 
uh, and uh, it is a virtue that we ought to rediscover. And it is in this spirit that I am pleased to introduce Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma. And let me explain to you two particular things. First of all, if you know nothing else about him, know that he exemplifies the spirit that Washington himself displayed in 1796 when he decided to return to his farm. Not once, but twice in his career, Senator Coburn has had power in his hands and willingly relinquished it for the good of the republic. From 1995 through 2001, he was the congressional representative for Oklahoma's second district in the U.S. House of Representatives. And at the beginning, he promised he would serve no more than six years, uh, which is the kind of promise that gets made when one is first running and is usually not kept. Uh, and so to the surprise of nearly everyone, except those I suspect who knew the senator best, at the end of six years, he went back to his medical practice uh, and did something far more important for the Republic, which is an aggregate delivery of about 4,000 babies over the course of your career. Uh, so those families, no doubt, thank you as well. Then in 2004, in April 2004, he decided to run for United States Senate, again extending a promise that he would serve only two terms. And this time, people with the memory of what had happened in the 1990s took him seriously. They thought, well, he probably actually will serve two terms. And he did better. He served uh, a full one term and then four years of the next. Uh, I will tell you a little story about uh, a very tenuous relation that I have with Senator Coburn back in the day when we were first founding, founding redstate.com, a website that some of you know now as the vehicle that Eric Erickson uh, uh, rode to prominence, very rightly so. In July of 2004, we were a very small website and we were trying to figure out who our first endorsement would be. And we knew that there was this guy, this former congressman from Oklahoma, Tom Coburn, who was running for United States Senate. And uh, we dubbed him Senator Trainwreck, because that's exactly what we were hoping he would do to uh, some of the processes in Washington, D.C. And I don't think we were disappointed in that. A very principled man, an individual who we thought would carry the banner of liberty, not for his own glory, but for that of the republic. Uh, and so he ended up being redstate.com's very first endorsement 12 years ago. 12 years at Lawn, I can say it was the right choice. Uh, we are pleased and privileged to have done it. And now we are pre pleased and privileged to welcome you to our policy orientation to talk to us about why Texas and the Texas legislature matters. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma. Joshua, thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning. Um, I, I told Joshua, I said, you know, you need to have a long introduction because I don't speak long. Uh, and, so, and most people like that. Uh, it's, I know it's not a trait that comes with the uh, uh, territory. I want to spend a few minutes this morning just talking with you about Texas and what you don't know about Texas. Texas is the star of the United States. The admiration, often not spoken, is there across this country for the people of Texas, what you do and how you do it. In spite of your sometimes very messy politics, and you all know what I'm talking about, <laughs> Texas leads the country in freedom. Texas leads the country in liberty. Texas leads the country in restoring what was once even greater liberty. So I have to admit, you know, I, I often tell people if Texas ever leaves, I'm going with them. Uh, <clears throat> but I have to admit a wonderful fondness for the state of Texas. And I always tell myself, wouldn't it be great if Oklahoma did what Texas did? And it would be. We'd actually be more successful. We have the same kind of people. We desire the same things, but we don't have the leadership. And what you see with TPPF is the focusing of that leadership and the appreciation of that leadership of those that work in both the legislature, but those that work outside. You know, it's not the politicians that make the difference. It's the people that make the difference. And, and before you think I'm getting too mushy, I still like Oklahoma football. You know, I still like Oklahoma State football. <clears throat> I know things aren't really in balance anymore in terms of the way it used to be. Uh, but, but, so I'm not, but I want to tell you a little story because I, th I think it reflects well on where we really are in our country. And, 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 and the story is about in, in Muskogee, we have a post office, and at that post office, we have the FBI. 
and you see the 10 most wanted picture up there. And a lot of times the grade stools will go through and look at the post office and look at the sorting machines and do all that stuff. And they were out there looking and somebody said, well, what's that? And the teacher said, well, that's the 10 most wanted people in the country by the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So she knocks on the door, the FBI agent steps out and says, would you kind of tell them about it? So he told them a little bit about it. This little girl grabbed his pant leg and said, and leaned down and he said, well, what? And he said, well, I don't understand. Why didn't you keep them when you took their picture? Uh, <laughs> so, but isn't that where, where we are in our country today? I mean, you think about it. Um, I have, I have about 130 pages of notes, but I'm only going to use about three of them. <clears throat> I tell you that story because it's easy to get disgusted with what's going on in our country today. And when you poll the country, the vast majority of Americans are worried about our future. They know something is not right. It's out of balance. Uh, and when you look at what the Pew Research says, we have this new generation called the millennial generation. It's now the largest demographic in our country. It's 82 million strong. And when you poll it, 95% of them have no idea of the three branches of our federal government. Our universities no longer teach Western civilization and American history. It's no longer required. So we now have a new culture of Americans that have no connection to the previous culture of our country. And it's a very dangerous thing for us today because what it will lead to is a lack of appreciation of the sacrifice and the success and the excellence that has been generated by what our founders gave us in terms of this wonderful, magnificent republic if we can keep it. <clears throat> and you all realize that we're the longest living republic ever. And every republic before us has died. And they've died over the exact same reasons. So the question comes is, can we cheat history? Do we have the capability to cheat history and not fail as every other republic has? And they all failed financially first before they failed politically. And I think we can. But I think we have to do some things to be able to accomplish that. I spent... 10 years in the United States Senate. I, I know the nastiness, all the warts, all the, the moles of the federal government. I did more oversight hearings while I was in the US Senate than the combined oversight hearings of the House and the Senate. We actually asked the questions. We actually published the reports. I was the only one that actually read GAO reports <laughs> and congressional research reports, all with valuable information how to solve the problems of our country. And I left two years early. I actually went to uh, the minority leader <clears throat> in 2009 and told him, I mean, in 2011, and told him that I would not serve out my term. And he said, why? And I said, you can't fix the problem here. I don't believe you can fix it here. I see the short-term benefit and decisions that are made for re-election, for advancing a party, but not for advancing the ideals of our country, not for advancing liberty, not for increasing freedom. I had a discussion with one of <coughs> uh, uh, TPPF's um, uh, criminal justice reform, Mr. Cohen, this morning. How many of you realize that we now have more federal police than we have U.S. Marines? Tell me where in the Constitution gives the federal government the right to have a police force anywhere. They don't. And yet, if you look around Austin, Texas, you'll find thousands of them. From VA to BLM to Homeland Security. You just, and so, so how, do, how have we lost that? We've lost that because we've lost sight of what's really important to maintain our liberty, and that's limited government. And we don't have limited government anymore, and so therefore the consequences of not having that 
have led us into financial difficulties. It's led us into lack of confidence in the rule of law. And it's led us into a position where we have a president that ignores the law when it comes to executive orders, a Congress which ignores the financial wellness of the country that benefits itself, and a Supreme Court that has abandoned the real meaning of the original Constitution. So how do you fix that? And our founders gave us a way to fix that. The way to fix that is to change and reinforce the enumerated powers that were guaranteed the states by the original founders of this country. To reestablish what the Commerce Clause really means. To reestablish what the General Welfare Clause really means. To not have two different constitutions, the one that supposed learned men know and create rights out of thin air that abandons the principles. Our first constitution wasn't perfect, but it's a whole lot better than the one the Supreme Court's given us today. So, in the wonderful constitution that we had, we had some very, I, I'm amazed every day. Uh, I, I'm almost 68 years of age, and I'm amazed and amazed, and I continue to be amazed the more I read about our founders. We don't come close to them intellectually. We think we do, but we don't. They actually knew civilization. They actually studied history. They knew it, and they knew human behavior. And so they were wise enough. George Mason, two days before the Constitutional Convention ended, he said, we've made a fatal mistake. We've allowed the, those in power to amend this Constitution, but we've not allowed those, the people of the states, the states and the people to amend the Constitution. So in a very short period of time, that was added to Article 5 to give us, us a way to reapproach limited government, to balance the powers between the three branches of government, and restore liberty. Have you ever asked yourself why, since 2008, our maximum growth on an annual basis has been around 2%? Why do you think that is? We, we have a very learned economist and, uh, you know, set in front of us, Senator Phil Graham. Why, why, why have we grown? Because the very spirit a free enterprise is being stuffed down by a bureaucracy that makes decisions that protects the bureaucracy but never makes the best decision. It's called Coburn's Rule of Bureaucracy. Never do what's best when you can do what's safe for the bureaucracy. And now we have this massive federal government that nobody knows all of it, and people are making decisions that impact lives. If you look at what's happening in Oregon today, people are missing the point. What's that all about? That's about limited government versus not limited government. That's about people standing up and saying, we've had enough. Why do we see Donald Trump leading in, quote, the polls? Because America is sick and tired of being abused and losing their liberty. And they have this false hope. <clears throat> that one individual, a president, can make the difference. They can make some difference. But the only way we fix What's wrong with it? I'm a physician. I've had cancer three times. Phil and I have a lot of things in common. And wonderful medicine has cured me three times. I mean, massive. Metastatic colon cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and melanoma, metastatic. And I'm still here. Why am I here? Because my doctors didn't treat my symptoms. They treated my disease. And the disease is we've abandoned the role of the states and the people in this country and given it over to a Levite, the federal government. And it's time we take it back. <clears throat> and you're not going to get that solved by electing more senators. You're never going to get 60 Ted Cruz's in the Senate. One president isn't going to make the difference. Look how hard Reagan tried. You know, young people today don't even know who Ronald Reagan was. Look how hard Reagan worked to try to downsize, to lessen the role. He couldn't do it. So how do we do it? 
we do it through a convention of the states, reestablishing what the Commerce Clause means, reestablishing what the General Welfare Clause means, forcing a balanced budget amendment on the federal government with generally accepted accounting principles, not Washington accounting. <laughs> and we impose term limits, not just on members of Congress, but on the federal judiciary. <laughs> the average life expectancy when our Constitution was written was 52 years of age. The average judge appointed in the first 20 years in this country was 47. Average five years. What's the average today? It's 25. Power corrupts, right? Now, I'll tell you as an aside, it doesn't corrupt me because I have a wife named Carolyn. <clears throat> and when I came home every weekend, she said, you're not a senator here, you're my husband. <laughs> So let me, let me end up just by saying to you, we don't have one problem we can't fix. But we have to really make sure we're fixing the problem. And a convention of states, to me, has no risk whatsoever in this country. What is a risk is to continue to do nothing to restore our liberty, to continue to allow the federal government to take away my freedom every day. I'll never forget as a businessman when Gerald Ford signed the Medical Device Act. I manufactured ophthalmic products. And all of a sudden, over the next year, I had this massive bureaucracy that came and told me everything I'd be doing in my business. And none of them knew a thing about my business. But they now had the power to tell me how to run my business and what I'd do with my business. So the point is, is we can restore that. I'll, I'll leave you with this final story. And it, it makes three points. There was a father who put his little four-year-old girl to bed. And about 10 minutes after he put her to bed, she said, Daddy, I want a drink of water. He said, Honey, I just gave you one. Now go on, go to sleep. About five minutes later, she said, Daddy, <clears throat> please bring me a drink of water. She, he said, Hon, now listen, I'm going to have to discipline you. I gave you a drink of water. Go on and go to sleep. So about 10 minutes pass, and then she says, Daddy, when you come to spank me, would you bring me a glass of water? <clears throat> well, there's three points to that. One, she was persistent. Number two is she knew what she wanted. She knew how to solve her problem. And number three, she was willing to pay the price to solve her problem. My call to you all is pay the price. We have to, as Americans, stand up and be like Texas all across this country. We have to say it's our freedom. God granted us our freedom. The government didn't give us a penny of it. We were granted our freedom as individual human beings. It's time for us to retake that. The way to do that is through a convention of the states. God bless you all. Thank you, Senator, for those marvelous remarks. Uh, we actually have a considerable amount of time for a Q&A that the Senator has graciously agreed to do, so feel free to ask your questions. When you ask questions, we have three persons. If you'd raise your hand, we have Emma uh, in the back right there. Raise your hand. We have Fernando there, and where's Eric? Right over there. So if you have a question, raise your hand. They'll bring a microphone to you and just speak into the mic, and uh, the Senator is happy to talk. And so we have a gentleman over there. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator, for your leadership uh, on Article 5 issues. Uh, you may be aware of the effort backed by 500 state legislators and three governors and the General Counsel of the Republican National Committee and other conservatives uh, to do what the states did when they forced Congress uh, to propose the Bill of Rights, uh, which is to force Congress a, uh, to propose an amendment that states want because Congress is afraid that the states might call a convention. It's called the Regulation Freedom Amendment, and it would require that Congress approve major new federal regulations. And I wondered what your thoughts are on the amendment to require Congress uh, to approve major federal regulations and the strategy of getting states to force Congress to propose an amendment. Well, uh, first of all, great question. That's just fixing one part of the problem. You're fixing a symptom. 
The symptom is, is the federal government puts out regulations that then become law that your members of Congress have never voted on. You can't hold them accountable, can you? But that by itself won't fix what's wrong with our country. Until you restore a balance between the three branches of the federal government, till you put limitations on executive power, till in fact you hold the Congress accountable in terms of finances in this country, and make them do the hard votes. Let me, let me just give you a side example. How did we get to where we are on Medicare being a $72 trillion unfunded liability? How did we get there? We got there through members of Congress refusing to raise the taxes associated with the increasing costs. And we got there through members of Congress voting to increase benefits, i.e., Medicare Part D, a $13 trillion cost with no revenue stream whatsoever. So until you fix it all, you're not going to fix any of it. And that's where Convention of the States is different than all the rest of the approaches that are trying to limit the federal government. Because we address it all. We address term limits, we address balanced budget, and then we address the scope and jurisdiction. And that's where that falls. You're right. Members of Congress ought to have to vote on any regulation that impacts the state of Texas so we can hold them accountable. You voted for that? Do you not know what you did? In other words, back to representative government. So I think it's a great question. It is a solution. It's one of the solutions of many. If we only treat part of the disease, I'll just make a parallel. If you come to me and you have a cough and fever and chest pain, and I said, oh, I can fix that. I can treat all your symptoms. I can get rid of your fever, I can get rid of your pain, and I can suppress your cough. But if you've got a pneumonia smoldering in your chest, guess what? All I've done is cover up the symptoms, and you're going to get a whole lot sicker. Matter of fact, you're going to get septic. You may even die. Because I treated your symptoms and not the problem. And Washington's biggest, one of its biggest deficits is it treats symptoms because that's politically palatable. Treating problems is hard. Being free is hard. It requires sacrifice of all of us. Not some of us, all of us. Thank you very much, Senator Coburn, right here in the middle. Um, thank you for that great speech. And I agree with uh, wholeheartedly in this convention of the states. But I do want to ask, I hear conservative leaders saying that a convention of the states is dangerous because you never know what the left will bring up. Maybe they'll bring up things like, you know, no voter ID ever required or, or really negative things. And you said you see no risk of the convention of the states. I'm with you all the way. But can you explain why you don't see it as a risk? Sure, because the, uh, the law is very clear. The applications that are made have to be identical. You have to have 34 states make that application. And anything outside of that application is out of order. Plus, you have an extra ability to hold control of that because Texas can put a delicate limitation amendment onto their application, which says anybody from Texas that votes for anything other than what's in this, that vote doesn't count. So you have complete power to not allow any of that. And none of our application allows that. So, so it, again, I would, I would make the point to you is the people that are opposing this today are opposing it on the basis of fear. This country was built on the basis of courage, not fear. <clears throat> what, we, what we should fear is not doing this because it won't be long to where we go just where every other republic has gone. You got one back there? You got one right back there. Senator, what is the uh, steps necessary to get a constitutional convention? Uh, well, it's not a constitutional convention. Let me correct your language. We're not reforming the whole, con con we're not redoing the Constitution. What we are doing is we're calling a convention for th three specific purposes of which we will offer amendments as a recommendation to the states. So what has to happen is 34 states through a joint resolution of the House and their Senate or their assembly and their Senate. Governors don't have anything to do with it. The judges don't have anything to do with it. 
they pass that. As soon as you have 34 states, the Congress has the right to say when it'll meet and where it'll meet. And I suspect that when they said you'll meet in Washington, the first thing that will happen is the members of this convention will say we're moving out of Washington. We're going to move to Kansas City. We're going to move to the, where, where you don't have this negative influence and this all-powerful federal government. So, so it, it's, yeah, Texas would be okay. Or how about Oklahoma City? <laughs> <clears throat> so, so it's real important that you use the right language on this. Because what scares people is, that, if, as to the previous question, if you're really having a constitutional convention, I agree, you could really open up a can of worms. But we're not doing that. We're very specific in what we're asking for. 34 states have to agree to that. And then the only thing that's germane is that is what we've asked for. And then when you get that, it, all it is is a recommendation of the states. And then 38 states have to pass that before it makes any difference. But I can tell you, I've been in a lot of states this last year. Americans are ready for us to take back our freedom. Senator Coburn, thank you for your remarks earlier. Here's a question that I'm just going to say it. What are the procedures for beginning impeachment hearings for the president, and why do you feel no one has started this yet? Is it groundless, or what in your view? Well, one is impeachment proceedings have to begin in the House. So that's number one. Number two is it has to be high crimes and misdemeanors. Uh, and that definition is not necessarily straightforward, considering what the, Look, the president has told us exactly what he's going to do. Ideologically, he said, I believe this. I mean, he, he's been pretty true to what he believes. The problem is, is what he believes most Americans don't believe. And so therefore, we, we, we become incensed that he's doing these things. And, he, and he, he's pushed it, there's no question. But it's not a high crime to do an executive order and then get it challenged in court and reversed. You know, that's a judgment call that you'd never win on. So, so the point is, is he's done something that most presidents have not done, is he's pushed the envelope. And one of the things that could happen in a convention of the states, for example, is to give Senator Phil Graham, while he's in the Senate, the right to challenge an executive order. In other words, give him standing in court. Because right now, your members of Congress, your senators have no standing to challenge the president. They have to, you have to go out and find somebody that is an injured party. So one of the things that could happen in a convention of states to limit this is you don't have to wait nine months to get something running through the courts before you actually challenge a president on an overly broad and beyond his power executive order. Um, so first things first, before I ask my question, I just want to say your 2014 waste book helped us kill a urban rail boondoggle in, here in Austin two years ago. Good. So thank you for that. Uh, my question is regarding a convention of the states, could it or should it be used? You, you discussed a lot of the things that the federal government is doing that are go far beyond its bounds. Um, but in a similar vein, how could a convention of the states be used to rein in the Federal Reserve? Um, I don't know. I'd have to think about that. <clears throat> Remember, the, the Congress can change the Federal Reserve. They just have to have the courage to do it. They have to have the knowledge to do it. Uh, you know, there's a couple of points that ought to be made uh, right now in terms of where we are. You've had monetary policy working since 2008, correct? But you've had no fiscal policy to join with that coming from the Congress that would actually help us grow. You've, as a matter of fact, you've had anti-growth fiscal policies coming from the Congress in the matter of tax increases or a, a supplemental emergency supplemental spending bill of a trillion dollars that in effect had about $100 billion effect in terms of stimulating the economy. Otherwise, it didn't have any effect. So <clears throat> I, I don't know. I, what, what, what I do know and believe and what I was trained in business school when I was a young man is markets work. 
I mean, if you think about health care, why is health care screwed up in America? Because we've not allowed markets to work. We haven't since the World War II. And our solution to it now is the Affordable Care Act. And the average premium increase in Oklahoma this year is 35%. I talked to somebody last night, and their premium increase was 42% here in Texas. So what's going to happen? Market, markets are going to work whether we say they are or they're not. So I don't know the answer on the Federal Reserve. That's just one of the many problems that we have in terms of allowing, we should allow markets to work. And so if it, I, would, I would have you go to Wall Street Week and look at something that was on there this past Sunday, talking about what interest rates are going to be in the future and why the Federal Reserve is never going to get us out of low interest rates. It's a pretty scary proposition. <coughs> Senator Coburn, how many states have bought off on this so far? What's your best case ETA for the Convention of States, and what do we need to do to help move it along? Well, uh, thank you. Great question. Four states have passed it. Um, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Alaska. Florida is a blue state, and it's passed it. <clears throat> well, there's 37 applications in file, in process right now. I would suspect 17 to 20 states pass it this year. I think we're three to four years from getting to 34. We're gonna, it will pass and pass and pass, and then we'll concentrate on two or three. And then there'll be a real battle. But a couple of things will come out of that. When the Senate and the House are starting to see what we're doing in the states, it's going to change behavior. They're going to say. We have to, we have to wrap it up. Okay. Senator, I want to ask one last question. Uh, especially since we have so many legislators who have spent their time uh, coming here and joining us and hearing you. What's your message for them? And what can Texas legislators in particular do to influence not just the national discourse, but the other states in the coming legislative session? Great. Three things. Lead on education. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just give you a short story. I have grandchildren in Oklahoma. The average cost of education in Oklahoma in public schools is $11,000 a year. My, my grandkids are going to a private classical school, and the cost of average is $9,000 a year. And, now think about that. And I sit and ask myself, why can't every kid in Oklahoma have this education? at $2,000 less per year than what the state spends? Well, we all know the answer to that. So <clears throat> school choice, universal school choice for every kid in Texas, every kid in America. That's what we need to do. <laughs> Number two, the second thing Texas can do is continuing to lower taxes. Lower taxes provides capital, that, and the free enterprise system runs off capital, invested capital, with individuals, not the government taking your money and deciding where to spend, but you deciding where to spend it. So lowering the marginal tax here, lowering real estate taxes. Then third and finally is fight Washington. Every chance you get. Thank you. Let, let, me, let me just leave you with one. The, we passed a, a, some transparency in, under my authorization and my authorship that became the transparency where you can see where federal government's been. There's a new website called openthebooks.com. Go to it if you want to see where federal money's being spent in Texas. Thank you. Senator Tom Coburn, everybody, please.